I'm your host, Gabriel Puebla. Our guest today is Loyola Montmary University Professor of Political Science and Chicano Studies, head of the Center for the Study of Los Angeles and native Angelino, Dr. Fernando Guerra. Dr. Guerra has sounded the siren regarding a wide range of social issues. So it comes as no surprise that Dr. Guerra and the Center have a new study regarding attitudes and trends within the Los Angeles region regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Guerra is with us today to discuss the study and the political importance of the government and media continue to handle the coronavirus outbreak and the consequences for the 2020 presidential election. Welcome, Dr. Guerra. Uh, thanks for having me, Gabriel. Thank you very much. So before we begin, I received an email because we've received emails and those out there. You can email at gabriel at wellnessstrategies.com. I received an email from a student at East Los Angeles College. The, the email reads in part, also in, in giving advice about episodes, another episode could focus on people like me, students who are visual performing arts majors who have had their lives completely destroyed, it goes on. Their work out on hold indefinitely because of social distancing. What is the Board of Trustees going to do financially to bolster um, uh, students here at East Los Angeles College? So I wanted to start with that, um, Dr. Guerra, because um, can you tell us a bit about the background of, um, of the study, how many participants, how many uh, who funded it? Just give us some background of how, how long did it take? Uh, did it go faster because of the coronavirus? Give us some yeah. feedback and about yourself yeah. as well. Yeah, so when I think about the Center for the Study of Los Angeles, what we try to do is research that is very relevant and can be immediately used by policymakers, uh, nonprofit, community groups, uh, academics, and students. And we try to design research that students can be involved in. Now, of course, in this time period, that's very difficult. The model for the Center for the Study of Los Angeles is research, action, justice. We conduct research that leads to action, that then leads to justice, hopefully. And that's when we, so that's our broad view. Obviously, when this uh, virus hit uh, the, uh, not only Los Angeles, but the whole country, the whole world, this pandemic, we, uh, what do we do at the Center for the Study of Los Angeles? We conduct research. What would be important uh, is to understand how Angelinos are feeling what they're willing to do or not to do so that when the city and the county together start making public policy that it could be helpful and contextualize their decisions and that was our idea but frankly the idea came from mayor garcetti himself on uh, march uh, 22nd he gave me a call and he said fernando i need to know what people are thinking um i know things that are happening from the data that we give scientifically but how are people feeling about this? What are they willing to do? How do they see this virus? How do they see what the locals, meaning the mayor and the county board of supervisors can do? And what are the residents willing to uh, follow? What are they willing to do? And so with that directive, uh, we, get, we began designing this research project. Now I'll tell you that from the idea of doing a research project to its final completion, usually takes us about six months. And we did this in three weeks. And obviously, because of the issue that is happening. Um, the, at Loyola Marymount University, the Center for the State of Los Angeles, we do all the aspects of the research. We do the research design. We do the questionnaire. We do the uh, data processing. And most importantly, we do the data analysis. There is one aspect that we do not do, and that is the data collection. What I mean by data collection is literally the interviews. So we hire an outside firm that will take our questionnaire, the way we program it into the computer, all the skip patterns and everything, and they, they will then have their employees do the phone calling. So we provide the sampling, we provide the phone numbers, we provide everything. We, all we're hiring them to do is a skill set of about 20 to 30 uh, people who are at call centers who know how to do this and do this all the time. That's what we hire. We can't train our students to do that because it just takes too long. And it's really not a skill set that we really want to teach uh, our students. Uh, we want them to know about research design and data analysis, but not necessarily the, the uh, working for a call center. So it was very dramatic, very quickly. We tried to figure out what it was going to cost if we had the resources to do it and how we can help the city. And so 
March 22nd, we got the call. We started on March 23rd. By April 8th, we had interviewed a randomly selected sample of 2,000 Angelinos from Los Angeles County. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Guerra, let's get into some of the questions. Mm -hmm. um, one of the questions, well, the, a lot of the responses, I think some of the viewers um, will find surprising, but where could they find and download the study themselves? Sure. Um, our website is uh, lmu.edu slash study LA. And obviously it's very fine, easy to find the LMU website, but if you go on to uh, slash study LA or search for study LA or the Center for the State of LA, you will come upon our website and you'll see our multiple number of studies, but the number one study that we currently have on the website, of course, is this study because we want people to be able to be informed about it. it you know, I was surprised. It's a long study, 150 pages, but um, let, let's, let's get into nine of the questions that, sure. that I'd like you to, to give us some responses. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, one, you asked a question, how, and we're, there's a lot of results, um, English speaking, um, according to um, results according to education, we're going to go over some, we're LA, we're a multicultural um, region, um, significant Latino population. You have different types of, of individuals who are, who are white, African-American, Asian, but you have four major categories. You have um, right. African-American, Asian, white, and Latino. So you ask a question, you say, how worried are you about your ability to buy food? And, then, and those results for very or somewhat worried, you have 46.4% of African-Americans are very somewhat worried, 59.2% of Asians, 53.5% of, 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 of um, white respondents, but 65.9% of Latinos. So you have um, on the low rate in terms of, of individuals who are worried about buying food, African-Americans are 46%. But Latinos are at 65.9%. Can you tell me why, what's the difference? Why are we seeing um, Latinos so worried? And not that African-Americans are not because 46.4% yeah. and, and Asians 59.2%. But why the difference? Yeah, I think uh, it's a, you, you've captured something very important uh, about the results that we have. And, and those results really center on while the majority of Angelinos and the majority of uh, Angelinos in terms of demographic groups, you know, Latino, Asian, African American, white, or income groups, or you know, um, uh, uh, marital status, or whatever. No matter how we cut it, the vast majority of Angelinos are worried uh, about all kinds of aspects of this, including their food insecurities. But one of the things that we found is the um, how much less African Americans are worried. In a sense. A, an, an idea that African Americans are not as concerned or don't feel that the virus is going to impact them to the same degree that Latino, Asians, and whites uh, uh, felt about it. And I think we've seen the results in that in terms of the, these uh, studies that we've seen about the disproportionate impact. And it goes to everything, including food insecurities. Uh, obviously, we can explain, contextualize why Latinos uh, have a high insecurity. Uh, they live, uh, you know, sometimes paycheck to paycheck. Uh, there's a greater tendency amongst uh, Latino communities to go to the markets more often. It's not unusual for, quote unquote, a uh, typical Anglo Angelino to go to the market, you know, every two weeks. Or, um, and whereas Latino families, they tend to go uh, every three or four days, uh, mostly because of their habits of wanting more fresh food, uh, maybe not having enough money to buy for two weeks, but they have to buy it as they get the individual money. So this creates an insecurity because they know they have to constantly be going to the market. Right. So let, let's go on to another question about paying bills. That goes mm -hmm. to, to your point. Yeah. How worried are you about the ability of paying bills? Very somewhat worried. African-American 48, Asian-Americans 52.8, whites 50.9, Latinos 68.9. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about a 20% delta between African Americans, whites, and Latinos, um, and and Asians, with regard to yeah. the ability to simply pay bills, this is in, in in the media right now. You're not hearing about about how um, the coronavirus pandemic is affecting Latinos and Latino psychology. 
but so what what is what is what is your study telling us about latino psychology about about coronavirus yeah so clearly again you see this pattern where latinos are the most concerned they feel insecure they know their own situation uh they have for a variety of reasons either as immigrant or children of immigrants um, or living in certain neighborhoods know that they are much more susceptible to this uh, they've seen it before the the previous downturn we had in 2008 last hit deeper and lasted longer for Latinos. And so they are very concerned about this. Um, the anomaly again are African-Americans. One possible explanation for African-Americans not being as concerned is that uh, they have a greater proportion of public sector jobs, meaning they're working for the city, the county, the federal government in terms of postal workers and, and things of that nature. And therefore those jobs are being maintained. That can explain a little bit of it. I don't think it explains all of it. Uh, and just, uh, again, less, maybe less outreach that has occurred of uh, the seriousness of this in terms of the African-American community when, while we were out in the field uh, doing the survey. Compared to the Spanish language uh, um, media and other media that Latinos consume, where they were very much aware of this. So just to be very clear, we're not saying African Americans aren't paying attention, don't have concerns. We're just not we're noticing for like the mayor wants to know what are some of the differences so that this data can be used yeah. to educate, re-educate, and continuously inform. But there was one question that was that was interesting because you're seeing differences between ethnic groups, unity between some and differences between others. Okay. Here you have a question. You said, How worried are you about your ability to protect your family? And that response very somewhat worried, 57.8% of African Americans said, how worried are you about protecting your family? 68.8% of Asian Americans, 63.1% of whites, and 75% of Latinos are worried about protecting their family. So yeah. you see Asian Americans and Latinos hyper aware mm -hmm. of, of, the, of their ability to protect their families. So you see some differences in that, or coming together of some ethnic groups yeah. and others. So whites and African Americans are less, again, still the majority correct, concerned, but yeah. a super and hyper majority of Asian and Latinos. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Again, almost a very similar pattern. Why are Latinos and Asian Americans more concerned? Um, part of the reason here could be partly immigration status not that uh, Latinos and Asians are all undocumented, which is not the case, but when you talk about extended families, they may have uh, cousins or family that have that status or recent status that they know how vulnerable they are. We've seen even uh, attacks upon permanent residents, and so they're concerned about that. You've seen the attacks on Asian Americans, blaming them for the virus, having President uh, Trump continue to call it the Chinese virus, the Wuhan virus, uh, and that leading to uh, discrimination against Asian Americans. So not only when you talk about protecting your family, are you talking about protecting against the virus, but you're also talk talking about protecting against, you know, um, these uh, hate crimes or regular crimes or even the economic impact. All those, I think, are much more relevant to Asian Americans and Latinos. So you're saying that the, 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 the effect of, of racist speech by President uh, or uh, Trump and others, it could potentially have affected that question? Oh, absolutely. I mean, Asian Americans are very well aware of what the Trump administration and how it portrays them, and that they, it makes them potential uh, targets to discrimination. And that why, that's why they have a greater concern about protecting their families than whites or African Americans. African-Americans and whites, because of their legal status, are much more secure about their place in society compared to Latinos and Asian-Americans. So let's move on to another question. We'll do a few more. How, if at all, has your household income seen, um, been impacted by the coronavirus pandemic? Somewhat or significantly reduced? Yeah. African-Americans, 43.7%. Asian Americans, 53.4, whites, 53.4, but Latinos, again, 65%. Yep. So you're in a region that is majority Latino, yep. and Latinos seeing a household income somewhat or significantly reduced in terms of the end number of Latinos, 
has a wider impact on the region. Can you go into that a little more? Oh, absolutely. I mean, obviously, uh, the Latino population is 50% of the city of LA, 50% of the county of Los Angeles. However, when you take a look, remember, this survey was actually only of adults, 18 or older, and that is only about 43% of adults are Latino, because we're much, Latinos are a much younger population that skews those numbers, right? And so 43% of adults in Los Angeles County are Latino, and they have a very high insecurity about their income. Again, because they are more recent employees given their youth, they are in more marginal jobs, they are living paycheck to paycheck, very concerned about this to a much greater degree than, than other groups. The anomaly again are African Americans. Why aren't African Americans as concerned as white Asians or uh, uh, Latinos? And it could be, uh, this is a hypothesis of mine, that they have, to a much greater degree, public sector jobs as school teachers working for school districts, the college district, the MTA, city and county government, federal government, and those jobs are protected, and they basically know that. So that reduces that number of insecurities. Thank you very, very much. So it, let's, let's move on to what's an interesting question about how much confidence do you have in the following individual to deal with the coronavirus pandemic? Donald Trump. So mm -hmm. African Americans, fair amount or, um, or great deal of confidence, 24.8%. Asians, 37.8%. Um, whites, 47.4%. And Latinos, 35.5%. So even though Latinos are being negatively affected in their perception by the coronavirus and pandemic, there seems to be a wider, a wider confidence level in Donald Trump than African Americans and whites, almost 50% have yeah. confidence in Donald Trump. So this is not unusual. We have observed this not only in Los Angeles, not only in America, but throughout the world. Every time that there's a crisis, people rally around the flag, rally around leadership to create unity and allow for a unified message to help us get out of this. So there have, there, Ours is not the only survey going around. There are multiple surveys that we track nationally and internationally. And we saw the um, uptick in approval and support of prime ministers and presidents throughout the world surge. And it surged tremendously. Um, the average uptick was around 25%, whether it was the Canadian prime minister or the uh, Italian prime minister or whoever it was around the world. The one who surged the least was Donald Trump, okay? Internationally, by far, he was in last place in terms of this popularity bump. Second, historically within the United States, after 9-11, uh, the search for uh, George Bush went through, uh, you know, went through the roof. Uh, same thing with Ronald Reagan, every time he did something that had to do with an international crisis. Not unusual, however, Donald Trump's bump was much less than any president has historically received. So what do we see with Donald Trump? Three things. Number one, his bump was much less than any other national leader of a Western democracy. Number two, his bump was much less than any U.S. president when historically facing a crisis. And then number three, we already have seen the waning of that support. It's declining nationally. Of course, we've only done one survey. If we were to do it again, I think that number would be even lower amongst all the groups. And so uh, while Donald Trump, Donald Trump enjoyed a, a bump, it was uh, you know, comparatively low, and it has de already begun to decline. Thank you. So the last question related to your study is, regard to the, it's interesting, the equal amount of confidence in, uh, in, in generic county government. How much mm -hmm. confidence do you have in the following uh, um, institution to deal with the coronavirus pandemic? The health department, African-Americans, 87.8%, Asians, 83%, whites, 89.1%, and Latinos, 84.8%. Again, Latinos on the, a little bit on the other side on that, but still you see an extremely high level of, yeah. of confidence in, 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 in our health department. Uh, not only, I mean, People are believing the experts here in Los Angeles, and to some extent is what uh, some of the people advising Trump have been trying to tell him, is that people believe in, in Dr. Fauci or Dr. Burke, who 
who are really leading this effort. Well, here in Los Angeles as well, when the LA County Office of Public Health speaks, people are listening. What's also interesting, you didn't talk about the numbers, but both Mayor Garcetti and Governor Newsom also received high marks in the upper 80s. And so you could see that um, people are trusting local government way more than the federal government. They are trusting local leadership, Garcetti Newsom, over national uh, leadership. And so that the fact that Newsom and Garcetti went out and were one of the first to talk about the stay at home orders, we saw the reaction to that. Interestingly enough, another little tidbit, while we were doing the survey, in the middle of the survey, uh, Mayor Garcetti also talked about having to wear masks. And we saw the support for using masks increase tremendously right after that statement. So in a sense, it was real live uh, data showing that Angelinos want to have uh, truthful information and are willing to respond to government when it tells them the truth, even when it's bad news, even when it's onerous actions that they have to take. They have been following Eric Garcetti and Governor Newsom to everything that they do. The vast majority of our Angelinos are behind the mayor and the governor in terms of fighting this coronavirus. So if you're here in Los Angeles and if you're watching this um, nationwide, and hopefully you are, um, if you're the Los Angeles Community College District, if you're the Los Angeles Unified School District, if you're government in these different and, and nonprofits, tell, tell, tell me how or tell them how they should use this data to mm -hmm. improve the situation for their citizens. Number one is citizens believe their local leadership. They're gonna believe their mayors, their local public health officials, their local council members, local representatives. Have them be the spokespeople as well and, and explain the impact of the virus on their community and what action they can take. It was incredible the degree to which Angelinos know about the virus and how serious it is. Overwhelming numbers that they understood what, how you catch it, how you prevent, and what the city was doing about it. Overwhelming numbers. So people are smart, especially during this time period. And they also are willing to follow the advice given by local governments if it's explained to them very clearly based on science. Overwhelming data and overwhelming support for that. And any locality, any city in the United States, if it follows that formula, you will be able to flatten the curve because citizens will listen to well-informed, trusted local government. Thank you. So uh, moving on to, to the media. So this mm -hmm. morning on CNN, you, you, there was a, a headline, alarming rate of Latinos affected by coronavirus. So in terms of um, Latinos and, and, and people of color in the United States, how is media covering the effect of coronavirus on Latinos and communities of color? Well, it's always secondary. It's always an uh, afterthought. It's always after they are bored with some of the other coverage. And so we've been into this for more, over a month. And a lot of the coverage was just in general, obviously nursing homes and all that kind of made sense. They didn't start finding out and start talking about people of color until the results came out about the disproportionate impact on African Americans, which I think also led to other media outlets to say, oh, wait a minute, what about Latinos? Let's take a look at that and let's take a look at what's happening with them. When in fact, it is these vulnerable populations that are really at the base of the, the, the core of what could cause a spike or what could cause what we want, which is a flattening the curve. If you pay attention to the more vulnerable populations, you will do better in reducing the total impact of this on everyone. Uh, because Latinos tend to have jobs that are uh, much more clustered, whether it's working in factories or whether it's working out in the fields or uh, uh, the typical job that a Latino has is much greater uh, social interaction within the job, you needed to really protect those jobs, which meant protecting Latinos. And it's now that they're beginning to focus on this that they see it's not that Latinos and African Americans are genetically predisposed to this uh, virus, is that they are just more vulnerable in, in social and economic situations.
that allow the virus to flourish. But Dr. Guerra, what is it about Latinos in the country? Because, uh, you know, for those who aren't too familiar with the Latino population, you have different types of Latino groups around the country. You have yeah. in the Southwest, mostly uh, Mexican and, and Central American. You have mostly Caribbean and South American in, in, in the Florida area, Puerto Ricans um, in, the, in, in the New York area. And I'm being very simplistic here. But what yeah. is it about Latinos that the national media doesn't seem to get or want to cover and even the talking heads on cnn fox yeah. msnbc really other than saying latinos are affected by coronavirus can't give an analysis the way that you're giving right now i mean a large part of it is that latinos are just taken for granted they're invisible i think the greatest example is here we are in los angeles the uh, uh entertainment capital of the world where movies are made where producers live etc and you take a look at the representation of Latinos in uh, film and television, and it's either non-existent or a very stereotypical. Yet, you, you would have to literally try to avoid Latinos in the city of Los Angeles. And it seems that this whole industry uh, does uh, uh, avoid them, take them for granted. And then people tell them, hey, if you want to grow your industry, you should uh, include Latinos. However, there's a very um, uh, uh, direct response to that from the movie industry in terms of the bottom line saying, what do you mean? Latinos come to the movies more than anybody else. Disproportionately, we don't even show them. We don't have to do that. All we have to do is put out entertainment. Latinos don't care if they're present, represented or not. Now, I'm not agreeing with that, but the data that they have kind of shows that in that disproportionately Latinos go to movies more than whites, blacks, or Asians, even though they're not represented, it continue to go. So there's no incentive for, uh, for the media to pay attention to Latinos because we still keep watching. What's interesting about that is that I've seen is that in, in you know, I'm happy happy for uh, Latin America's movie industry to be doing yeah. well. And, you know, everyone's watched Narcos and, and all those episodes, but, in terms of, of, of media representation of Mexican Americans and Latino Americans, Cuban Americans, Puerto Rican Americans, yeah. and here it seems as though Latin Americans have, have more access to the US media market and the media than those of us born here. Yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah, how many Mexican, not Mexican American, not Mexican raised, but Mexican uh, directors have won the Oscar in the last couple of years. Uh, they've, they've, they've actually dominated, right? Uh, and you see how many actresses uh, come over, even in our own local Univision, Telemundo, et cetera, you, you see that the talent that's put before the camera is all uh, Latin American. And then behind the scenes, you do see some Mexican Americans, but it is just a, 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 a constant a vicious cycle that continues to exclude not only the Latino face, but more importantly, the Latino voice, the, the Latino experience, which could be very educational in terms of what is happening in Los Angeles and in this country. So and we're, we're gonna move on to Latin America in a second. It's just interesting that the one place, if you're, if you're Latino in the United States, where if you're an actor, you can get a, a good job is in um, the narco um, yeah. episodes that are coming yeah. up. But in terms of, of Mexico, you have this morning reports that uh, Nicaraguan president um, has not been seen, uh, uh, Daniel Ortega has not been seen for a month. Um, and you have um, uh, Andres Manuel Obrador in Mexico seemingly still not really taking the coronavirus um, uh, pandemic seriously. And um, I'm not getting that Americans understand that while we, while, you know, Europe and we care that the British prime minister, you know, had the coronavirus, um, we have 130 million people in Mexico. Latin America is here, physically important. Latin America mm -hmm. is important to us. Yet media is really ignoring the potential disaster that might occur in Mexico. With and, and tell, tell me about that situation. Well, uh, again, um, it's just taken for granted. Uh, Mexico is actually our number one trading partner. Uh, uh, Mexico is our number one uh, uh, tourism partner, both Americans going to Mexico and Mexicans coming to the United States in terms of tourism. We are so linked with the economy and the culture of Mexico, and people just completely dismiss it. Uh, while certain sectors understand this, 
uh, the vast majority of Americans uh, don't. Uh, and as a matter of fact, want to undermine it and want to claim that part of our stagnation, part of the economic decline is based on the North American free trade agreement. And so they just dismiss it and want to continue to focus on uh, Europe and the Pacific market of Japan and China. Both of them very important, but actually a lot less important than Mexico and Canada combined. And people just don't understand that. So it's, it's th this, this, this basically this level of discrimination of media in not understanding Latinos in the United States, citizens, part of the country, goes over to affects Latin American foreign policy, which later will affect U.S. foreign policy right. and our economy, because we can't reopen and have this trade with Mexico and, and Latin America. Am I correct? That's right. It's a vicious cycle. I mean, the more you ignore Latin America, the more you disinvest in Latin America, the greater you're going to have immigration, which then causes potential uh, social issues in, in the United States. Whereas if you uh, had a quote unquote Marshall Plan for the Central American countries, etc., we would have solved so many different issues. Uh, you need to focus on the Western Hemisphere. It, it, you know, and I hate to go to the isolationist aspect of Donald Trump, but if you think about it, he should be isolationist within the Western Hemisphere uh, to protect against China and to protect against the vagaries of, of the oil industry or other industries that are impacting the United States and really invest in these countries that make it a lot easier for us to trade and really build an incredible uh, 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 trading block, economic block, but it, it, they just can't look south. It always has to be east or west. Final question. Is there, is there anything that um, Joe Biden or Donald Trump could look at your poll and say, I'm learning from this that, that, they, that might show us something for the presidential election coming up? Yeah, absolutely. One of the main conclusions I draw from this survey is that while for the last couple of years, trust in government has been declining, in this crisis, Angelinos turned to their local government, to their local leaders, and are trusting them again. If you, as a leader, don't take this trust and do the right thing, it will just create a, a situation where trust will be even more difficult to rebuild in the future. And I think Eric Garcetti is doing the right things with this trust, communicating effectively. Donald Trump is doing the wrong things with this trust. And that's why his numbers are dropping very quickly after this uh, bump he got trying to be supportive. People gave Donald Trump the benefit of the doubt and said, okay, you've been terrible, but we're gonna now support you so that you can address this virus. And he's blown it. The opposite is true here for Eric Garcetti. And Gavin Newsom. Dr. Guerra, is there anything else that you would like to, to share? Um, when you are a policymaker or just a typical resident of the city of Los Angeles or any place in the United States, um, you want to make decisions and you want to be data informed. And that's what we have provided is to give you data. But you shouldn't be data driven. You should be values driven. Only use data to the fact that it can help you uh, decide and create your options in terms of what are the values that you want to project and what is it, the vision that you want to see. Never be data driven, be data informed. And hopefully this is what the Center for the Study of Los Angeles at Loyola Marymount University has provided with this study. Dr. Guerra, Professor of Political Science and Chicano Studies, Center for the Study of Los Angeles, lifelong Angelino, Thank you for doing this study. Have a good rest of your day. Be safe with your family. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. We have a lot of great content coming up. So if you're on Facebook, share and like us. If you're on Twitter, follow and retweet. If you're on Instagram, follow us. And if you're on YouTube, subscribe and share our content. Be good to your families in this time. Have a good rest of your day.